Glad to see all of you here this morning. God bless you. You know, before we go into prayer real quick this morning, uh, I want to acknowledge one of the pillars of this church, Miss Ruth Van Noy. Her birthday is coming up next week. I believe it's on a Tuesday, I believe. But we want to say happy birthday to you today, Ruth, sister. God has truly blessed you, and, and we can only hope that he get us as far as you have Amen. in our lives today. God bless you, sister. May God continue to bless you in all that you do in your life. God bless you. The other request I have for you this morning is uh, Sister Elva sent a text message out this morning. Uh, her husband, Gilbert, is, is in a lot of, he's, he's very uncomfortable and in a lot of discomfort because he's retaining a lot of water. And she's, she's waiting for the uh, doctor to get in contact with him and uh, find out what they need to do. So this morning when we go into prayer, keep Brother Gilbert in mind, would you please? Yes. And uh, say a prayer for him Amen. also. So would you bow your heads with me, please? Oh, dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we come to you today to say yes, thank you. Do, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us and all that you're going to do for us. Thank you for these days that you've given us of the coolness of this week, dear Lord Jesus. We thank you for that, dear Lord Jesus. Father, there's so much happening in our church and in this world today, dear Lord Jesus. Sometimes people may wonder, where are you, Lord? Are you there? But you're, you're the God that rolled away stones, and you're the God that parted the seas and, and, and moved mountains. And you still do it today, dear Lord Jesus. You still do that same thing today. You are here, and you are in our midst every day of our lives. We just have to believe and trust in you, dear Lord Jesus, and know that you got everything in control and under control, dear Lord Jesus. Father, may we continue to keep our faith in you, dear Lord Jesus, and never lose faith, dear Lord Jesus. May we never turn from you, but always run towards you, dear Lord Jesus, in our lives, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for that. Father, touch all those individuals this morning that are in need of you. Dear Lord Jesus, that are sick and ill this morning, Father, touch them in a mighty way. Father, we thank you for, for being all omnipresent, dear Lord Jesus, because there is so much happening here in our own church. We can keep you tied down right here all day long. But, Father, you are everywhere. You are everywhere, and we thank you for being who you are. We thank you for being sovereign, dear Lord Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that. Father, just touch your people this morning, Father, in this church that, today, dear Lord Jesus. Let your spirit move among us, Father. Let us feel you. Let us feel your presence this morning, dear Lord Jesus, and know that you are here. You are here. You have never left us. Father, you said you would never leave us nor forsake us, dear Lord Jesus. And we believe that, dear Heavenly Father. We believe that. So, Father, touch us this morning, dear Lord Jesus, and just fill us with your, your glory and, your, and your, your spirit this morning, dear Lord Jesus. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the worship team this morning. Is getting ready to sing praises to you, Father. Just continue to bless them in the, in the things that they do for you, dear Lord Jesus, to uplift your name, the name above all names, dear Lord Jesus. Father, and as always, as our pastor gets ready to bring forth this message to your people, dear Lord Jesus, always, dear Lord Jesus, always touch his heart, always fill his heart with your words, dear Lord Jesus, and what you would have him say to your sheep today, dear Lord Jesus, and lead us in the right direction, dear Lord Jesus. Father, bless his family, his wife, his children, dear Lord Jesus. Keep your arms around them always, dear Lord Jesus, and hold tightly in your bosom, dear Lord Jesus. Father, we love you, and we ask all of this this morning in your precious and glorious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me if you can? Let's worship the Lord this morning. There's no other name but the name of Jesus that we come to give all the glory to. Amen.
see the King has come The light of the world reaching out for us There is no other name There is no other name Jesus Christ our God
Come on, give a hand of praise to the Lord this morning. There is no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. The name of Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Come on. In your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ In our King. In your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ our King. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. You're the resurrected king. You're the resurrected king. You've conquered death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. And because you've conquered death, hell, and the grave, so do we. Because there's a resurrection power that flows in you and me. It's the resurrection power that flows in us this morning. And it raises us above all the shadows. It raises up up of all the enemies that we may encounter today. We are flowing in resurrection power. How many believe it this morning? If you do, give a hand of praise to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. That's why we look to you, Lord. <laughs> In you is found life. In you is found healing. In you is found deliverance. It's all in you, Lord. So this morning we come and we look to you. Our eyes are upon Jesus. Our eyes are not upon the problems of this world or the difficulties that we may be facing. Our eyes are upon the author and the finish of our faith, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So God, we look to you and we know that there is victory in your name. I said there's victory in your name. Yes. Victory in your name.
Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever and all my days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns.
your presence fill this place.
Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence in our hearts. Thank you for your presence among us, oh God. We just worship you, Lord. We just worship you. We just worship you, Lord. We just worship you. Yes, Lord. We magnify your holy name, Jesus. Oh, there's no other name but the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We lift up our hearts to you, Jesus. Magnify yourself, oh God, in the midst of your people. Touch those who are hurting today, Lord. Bring healing and deliverance in the name of Jesus. Move upon their hearts, oh God. Move upon their bodies right now, Lord, wherever they may be. 
who are in this room, oh God, wherever they may be tuning in from. Bring healing in the name of Jesus. Bring deliverance in the name of Jesus. Bring freedom in the name of Jesus. Break every bondage. Break every chain. Every shackle is shattered in the name of Jesus. Every sickness is gone in the name of Jesus. Today we declare that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over every circumstance, over every situation, over every heart, every life. Jesus is Lord. He reigns with power and majesty. He reigns with grace and mercy and kindness and compassion. And he's the one who gives life. He's the one who gives healing. He's the one who gives freedom. All glory belongs to him. All glory belongs to him. All glory belongs to the Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. By your stripes we are healed, O Lord. Oh, by your love we are set free. By your compassion we are saved. We give you glory, we give you glory, we give you glory. Thank you, Lord. If you believe it this morning, just raise your hands where you're at. Just say, thank you, Lord. Just give him thanks. thanks. Thank him for your miracle. Thank you for his hitting touch. Thank him for his grace and his mercy that's flowing in your life right now. That provision is being made for you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Provision is being made for you right now. Saith the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're the provider. give you glory, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you praise. We bless you, Lord. Thank 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 you, Lord. Bible says that there remaineth a rest for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Be at peace this morning. 
Rest in his presence. Rest in him. The Bible says that he gives his beloved rest. That word rest is shalom. He giveth his beloved shalom. Jesus is our shalom. Jesus is our well-being. Jesus is our peace. Be at peace. Be at rest in the presence of the Lord. Be at rest. Be at rest. Be at rest. Don't struggle anymore. Be at rest. Let it go. Release it. Release it in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon the Lord, for He cares upon you. Cast all of your cares. Let it go. Release it. Just turn it over to the Lord. And rest in His presence. For He's got you. The Bible says that He has you. Your name is written in the palm of His hands. So receive. Receive the rest of the Lord. Receive His peace this morning. Wherever you may be. Wherever you may be. So we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for your presence and your peace and your joy unspeakable and full of glory. We're resting in you today, Lord. We're going to rest in you. And we'll give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. you Lord the people of God said amen and amen thank you Lord thank you Only Jesus can do that. So as a believer, you and I have that wonderful assurance and that wonderful understanding that he is here to minister to our needs. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you are a peace giver. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord this morning. So would you turn with me to one scripture, a very simple, straightforward scripture found in Psalm 140, verse 13. Psalm 140, verse 13. As I said earlier, we live in a, a world of turmoil, a world of confusion and chaos. What's going on in Afghanistan? What's going on in uh, Cuba? What's going on in Haiti? What's going on in different parts of the world, including our own country? I was listening to uh, Robbie Dawkins. Robbie Dawkins is a young well, he's not that young anymore, but he's an evangelist that travels into the, all over the Middle East. And um, he's in close contact with the church in Afghanistan. The church in Afghanistan is one of the fastest growing underground churches in the world. And he was stating that the, strong, the church there is a strong church. They are strong in their faith because the moment they got saved, they knew and understood that it may cost them their lives. But nevertheless, they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and proclaimed him among the people. 
And right now, there is a persecution going on. Don't be fooled by what the, the president is saying, his, his advisors are saying. They are being persecuted. They're going house to house. And they are getting names and addresses and information. Some people are being beaten. Some people are being tortured. But what's going on is they're waiting until America finally pulls out. In other words, they're looking at August 31st. And once, once that happens, the great the bloodbath will begin. These people are bloodthirsty killers. They, they, they have no rule of law. To think that they are going to abide by peace treaties and so forth is absolutely insane. They, have, they are setting up their Islamic Republic with Sharia law. And if, if you do not convert or if you somehow are sympathetic to what they call the infidels, you will lose your life, period. Men, women, and children, they'll wipe out your family. They don't care. That is the type of people that you're dealing with. Yet there is a strong church in the midst of it all. And we thank God for their faithfulness. We need to continue to pray for them. So all of this is not only going on there. This has been going on all over the world. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is suffering great persecution all over the place. Whether it's in China. There's been a tremendous crackdown again on Christians in China. A crackdown on Christians in North Korea. Now Afghanistan. We know about Iran. We know about Syria. We know about all of these different places where they are cracking down and uh, destroying churches and trying to um, totally annihilate Christians and anybody else who does not believe in Islam and the Quran and Muhammad as their prophet. That is truth. And uh, anything that is said otherwise on the news is propaganda. It's just pure lies. I'm talking about people who know, who have contacts with those folks on the ground. They tell you this is what's going on in real time. So we need to pray. Tonight we have a prayer meeting, as I've been announcing last week. Tonight, Sunday, 6 o'clock, we'll be gathering here to pray. The following Sunday, we'll be gathering at 6 o'clock to pray for the needs of our people. And, of course, for the needs of our city, in our state, in our nation. This state is um, facing a recall in just a few weeks. And you need to vote. I said you need to vote. Let your vote be heard. And make sure, you, I, would, I would highly suggest that you vote in person. I'll say it again. I highly suggest that you would vote in person. Do not trust. See, this is our problem. We are trusting people. But there is evil everywhere. And there is fraud everywhere. The, the America that most of us grew up, grew up in is not the same America that we live in today. There's so much corruption and so much, there's a grab for power. So I would say to you, you need to go vote. Show up and vote, but vote in person. That's the best way. That way nobody can mess around with your vote. Even by mail sometimes is a tricky thing. So just be aware of that, please. So we got things going on here in California. We have things going on in our own city with a rise in crime and a rise in violent crime. Violent crime is rising in Fresno. People are being slaughtered in our streets. That is truth. I've been in the hospital and I've seen how many people come in with gunshot wounds. Children, women, men, it doesn't matter. Gangs are just growing and growing. At one time, they thought they had it controlled. It is out of control. Out of control. The gang warfare, that's most of this is, is gang warfare. People fighting for territory. The rise of fentanyl and all these drugs that are hitting the streets that are, you know, a thousand times more addictive than other drugs. And in fact, most of it is, it is literally, it'll kill you. One shot of it will kill you. I know that because I've seen it in the hospital. Young men, young women coming into the hospital OD because of one shot of this particular type of drug. And they, they go into convulsions and they die in the hospital. This is going on in our city. 
This stuff is going on in our neighborhoods. With the rise of crime, the, the uh, what do you call it, the homeless situation is out of control. Out of control. Last yesterday as I was driving to the church to do some stuff, I saw a young man who was homeless and he's half naked in the ministry throwing rocks at cars because he was so mad and violent. Just throwing rocks at cars and throwing rocks at people. These are mentally ill people who have been loosed in the streets of Fresno. And some of them, because of their lack of medication, a lack of uh, being cared for, are manic and they're manic in their manic situation, they can become violent. That's happening in our streets every day. Every day we come to this property and there's junk thrown all over the place. The property's a mess. We got to constantly clean things. They, they break things and they smash things. We, we just had this past month, I was talking to Kenny about it, you know, um, just this past month, there was an issue with our sprinklers. They were snapping off stuff and water was running everywhere. And this is brand new news to everybody. I mean, our water bill this month is unbelievable. It is outrageous. Why? Because of that's what they're doing. They're snapping off these things and the water begins to run. And next thing you know, we have water. We're watering the whole creation. We have garbage constantly be having to be picked up all the time. Not only us, everybody's going through it. We're not the only ones. Everybody's going through it. They get violent sometimes and they start breaking windows. If you notice how many busted windows and busted doors in all of these establishments along here of Chestnut and along the different areas of our town, they're constantly breaking windows. So we got that going on. We have constant violence. We have a, 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 just a, you know, an amazing amount of crime and problems that are happening in our city, in our state. Our nation right now is facing all kinds of issues. There's great division among the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, and the masked and the unmasked. There's great division that's happening. People are, are turning on one another. Family members are turning on one another. It's just amazing. Marriages are turning on one another. This is what's going on in America today. Why? Because we've turned our back on Jesus. That's why. We've turned our back our, on God. We kick God out of the schools. We kick God out of government. We kick God out of all these spaces. And guess what? In that vacuum, the devil moved in. Some of you may not, well, m most of you would remember. But back in the day, 25, 30, 40 years ago, even more, 50 years ago, there was a mad rush to leave the inner city. And everybody wanted to go to the suburbs. Everybody, want, everybody wanted to go to the middle class and upper class suburbs and plant their church there. And they left the inner city. Well, guess what? When they left the inner city, you know who moved in, right? The devil moved in. Gangs moved in. Organized crime moved in. Prostitution moved in. Are you hearing me? Drug trafficking moved in. And most of our cities in America are nothing but shells of what they once were. I remember as a kid back in the day, we used to go downtown to go shop. There were no malls. Remember that? You go downtown. And downtown was a clean area, and it was a restaurant, and it was a beautiful place, a great place to go spend a Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening. And when you go downtown, just walking down the streets, you can't do that anymore. All that is gone. There was once a, many years ago about, it would be in the 1950s, right after World War II, there was a great English uh, philosopher who came to, to visit America, and this is what he said, America is not great because of government or because of money. America is great because America is good. Well, that's long gone. America ain't good. I said America ain't good. And you know why America ain't good? Because America don't like to go to church anymore. Can I be real about it? America doesn't want to go to church anymore. They'd rather stay home. And we're feeling it right here. Every church is feeling it. 
The numbers were between 20 and 30 percent. People will not return to church. In some churches, it's more than that. Because it's not convenient anymore. Or because they're afraid. They'll go to Walmart. Come on now. They'll go to Winco. They'll go to their favorite stores. They'll even go to restaurants. But they won't come to church. Because they're afraid. Afraid of what? The only thing you're going to catch in the church is the Holy Ghost. My God. Boy, the church needs to wake up. <laughs> we need to get back to the basics. So turn with me to Psalm 140, verse 13. It says, this, Surely righteous people are praising your name, and the godly will live in your presence. This morning I want to talk to you about the very basics, and that is, we need to return to living in His presence. Father, I pray that you would bless these words that I speak this morning, that they would come from your heart. They would come from your spirit, Lord, as you lead me to speak. I pray, God, you'll give us all ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, and a heart to receive it, a mind to comprehend it, Lord, and a will to put into practice. That we who are called to be your righteous people will be people who worship you, and people who continually live in your presence. To thee be all the glory this morning. Holy Spirit, take full control. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. The psalmist says here, surely. In other words, this is a fact. This is a truth. A truth. This is as sure as sure can be. That righteous people are praising your name. Righteous people. So as we read this scripture, one of the things that he's trying to tell us is that as if you're going to be a follower of God, if you're going to live in His presence, then you need to live righteously. Righteousness. It's a word that is kicked around, but very seldom people understand it. Righteousness means right standing with God. And there's only one way to be in right standing with God. And that is to be in Jesus. If you're not in Jesus, you're not in right standing with God. You're on the wrong side. You're on the bad side. But if you're in Christ, then you are in the right side. You are right standing with God. Why? Because God does not look at your righteousness he does not look at you. He looks at the Christ in you. None of us can be righteous. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. You and I cannot earn uh, righteousness. We cannot conjure up righteousness in ourselves. In fact, our own self-righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Unacceptable. It is a dirty thing. It is a, a contaminated thing. It is an unclean thing. No, you cannot earn it. You can't work it up. But instead, you receive it by believing in Jesus Christ. It is imputed to you. Which means it's given to you because you put your faith in Him. Christ gives you His righteousness. And you better know that Christ is in right standing with God. The Bible declares it very several times where Jesus, where God spoke audibly and said about Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The moment that you give your heart to Jesus Christ, the moment you, you come into a relationship with Him, you exchange your old nature and your, you exchange your old self-righteousness. That one was nailed to the cross at Calvary once and for all. And now God gives you His righteousness. Now we're called to live that way. To live righteously. To live the right way. 
That means is to shun sin, amen? To turn our backs on evil. In fact, the Bible says don't even allow it to be mentioned among you. We know what the word tells us in the book of Galatians that the, the works of the, of the flesh are these and it enumerates all these different things. And all of that stuff is what happens when people do not walk in the righteousness of Christ. The Lord says, run away from that. That stuff shouldn't even be named among you. Listen, we are to be different. I said, we are to be different. We are to live differently, talk differently, act differently. Because we are now God's righteous people. Doesn't mean that we're walking around thinking that we're better than anybody else. No, but we have a better standing because we are in Christ Jesus. Our boast is not in us. Our boast is always in Christ. Because without Him, we are, we're lost. We're undone. In fact, without Him, we're on our way to hell. But in Him, He has made us righteous. Which means we are in right standing with God. And all of that is a gift of His amazing grace. Somebody say amen. So we are the righteous people that He's talking about. Because we're born again. Because we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because His righteousness has been imputed to us. So He's talking about us. So it says, surely, most of surely. In other words, this is a fact. The righteous people are what? Praising your name. That leads us to the second thing. If you and I are called to be righteous, one of the first things that it ought to produce in us is worship. Worship. Because we recognize what God has done for us, amen? We recognize the majesty of the King. We recognize the power and the awesomeness of our God. And how can we not but worship Him? To give Him reverence. To give Him honor. To give Him the glory. To give Him the praise. Not just for half an hour on a Sunday morning, but to do it every day. And we don't worship any way we feel like it. See, that's the problem with the American church. We want to do things any way we feel like it. That's a bunch of baloney. It's not how you feel like it. You worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. In spirit, in other words, motivated, inspired, amen, by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will always lead you to the truth. And the truth is not only Christ, the truth, but also the truth of His Word. So you can say that we ought to be motivated, inspired by the Spirit of God and worship God according to His Word. Well, when you read the book of the Lord, you find out that there are many ways to express that that we ought to be doing. We ought to shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. I said we ought to shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. But I don't feel like shouting. So what? Shout anyway. I ought to sing unto the Lord a new song. Amen. His praise ought to be what? Continually in my mouth. Not just on Sunday mornings. You ought to be praising God all the time. It's amazing how many secular songs we know, but how few Christian songs we know. It's amazing how that works. Jesus have mercy on us today. We are to be worshipers, continually worshiping, continually filling your heart and your mind with God's worship. Quit filling your mind with the garbage that the world gives. I don't care if oldies, I don't care if it's new, I don't care if it's contemporary. Listen, it's all garbage if it's not Jesus. I said it's all garbage unless it's not Jesus. Fill your mind with the things of God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
I can go on, I can give you a whole list of what the Bible says about Shabbat and, and all these different words that are used to praise the Lord. And, and some of it means to, to, to be exuberant, to, to shout, to dance before the Lord, to, 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 to uh, raise your voice, to raise your hands, to give God, and, and to do so in a very exuberant expression. But most people don't do that because I don't feel like it. Who said it's about feelings? Who said it was about feelings? Listen, was Paul and Silas feeling it when they were in the dungeon, when they were in the prison, and they were beaten, and they were chained, and they were in stocks, you know? In other words, their hands were, were bound, their feet were bound, they were in the bottom of the pit, they were in that darkness filled with filth and, and all this garbage, and most likely thinking our, our life is about to end. Do you think that they felt good? You think those stocks felt good? Those chains felt good? Those stripes on their backs and those beating on their head felt good? You think they felt like praising God? No, but they began to praise God anyway. And as they began to worship God in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their bondage, in the midst of their situation, the Bible says that God heard their prayer and all of a sudden there was an earthquake. Ooh, santo. A sound came from heaven. First the sound rose from earth to heaven. And then God responded. And the sound came from heaven. And it caused everything to shake and quake. It had nothing to do with feelings. But we're so feely and touchy and everything's going to be just right. Enough of that garbage. That's utter garbage. We are to worship the Lord. It's not just our emotions. It's an act of our will. I will praise the Lord. I will worship the Lord. I will exalt His name. It doesn't say, I feel like it. It says, I will. It's an act of my will. I'll praise Him in the midst of the storm. I'll praise Him in the midst of the pain. I will praise Him in the midst of the situation. I will praise Him at all times. Somebody say amen. amen. My gosh. A church that does not worship is a weak church. It's a withered church. Got quiet there. Because worship is an act of faith. It's expression of love. It's an expression of total surrender. It's an expression that says, not my will, God, but thy will be done. I will worship you. That's why, I, again, I listen to what's going on in Afghanistan and, and the reports that just came back and Brother Robbie Dawson is hearing from them. And they, they, you know what they're doing? They're still worshiping God. They're still praising the Lord. They're still witnessing. They're still doing what God called them to do, even though they're facing down the barrel of an AK-47 from the Taliban. Because worship to them is not some little emotional moment. It's life. It's life. Not us. Oh, not here in America, not in the West, not for us. We worship only if we feel like it. We raise our hands when we feel like it. We raise our voice when we feel like it. And when we don't feel like it, we make sure everybody knows that we don't feel like it. By the faces that we make. Oh. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying. But one thing that I found in my 30 something odd years of serving the Lord as a, as a pastor and a preacher be aware that I, from up here, I can see everything. And I can see when people put their hands in their pockets. I can see when they fold. I can see when they're on their phone. I can see when they're doing this, the other, and the other. All of these little things that they're doing, all this fidgetiness, getting up and going to the bathroom a thousand times. Oh, I can see all of this stuff. You can tell if they're engaged or not. It's rough. 
and again, I'm saying this, and I know this, because I've been hearing this lately. Ooh, what's wrong with pastor? He's mad. What's wrong with pastor? He's upset. Pastor's just telling you the truth. You know, and there's, there's such a thing called righteous indignation. You know that, right? The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. So I can be angry as long as I don't sin, right? But it is upsetting. It is when, when you look at a congregation, like I said, and, and not just here. I've seen it all over in all of our ministry, everywhere I've been. And, and I'm not the only one. You can talk to pastors that, you know, the, the worship team and the worship leaders, they prepare and they, they come ready and they give it all they got. And people just looking at them like they're, you know, just there. Like people won't raise their hands unless you tell them to raise your hands. People won't clap unless you tell them to clap. People won't raise their voice until you tell them to raise your voice. Listen, nobody ought to be telling you any of that stuff. That ought to be in your heart. But no, not us. Many times we come to church and we're like, like telling the worship leaders and the, and, the, and the preacher, you know what, I'm here so move me. I'm here so inspire me. In fact, you're lucky that I'm here. I could be somewhere else. So now that I'm here, come on, give me your best shot. Give, give me what you got. How arrogant can we be? Now nobody says that. But that's how many live. Because actions speak louder than words. It says, surely the righteous people are praising. Not half praised. Or will praise. Are praising. Which means the present, the continual, continually praising. Yesterday they praised, today they praise, tomorrow they praise. They're constantly praising. They are praising. Somebody say amen. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, they are worshiping because they're worshiping God in spirit and in truth and not just with emotions. Then it goes on to say, the godly. So not only are we called to be righteous, but we're also to be called, we ought to also to be godly. Godly. Comes from the word godliness, which means Godlike. So to be godly or walk in godliness means to be godlike. Well, Pastor, how could we be godlike? Well, because we're now the children of God. Hello. The Bible said to them that received him, speaking about Jesus, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Your heavenly father is the king of glory and the creator of heaven and earth. You are now part of, the, of God's family. You are a child of God. So therefore you ought to act like it. We ought to walk worthy of the calling that we have. We have been made as children. And we need to be walking it out daily. Not just on Sunday. Oh my goodness. We are all in a process of becoming more and more like Jesus. The Bible says, the old things have passed away. Behold, I make all things brand new. You and I are a new creation. That means the old garbage needs to fall away. I said the old garbage needs to fall away. And you need to start living differently. And quit your excuses. It's amazing what thousand excuses that we make. And again, I compare my, this to, to those dear brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that's going on today. They make no excuses. And they have all the excuses in the world. But they don't, no, they continue to live righteously and godly before because they know at any moment they, they're, they're going to meet the king. At any moment, this could be their last moment. And they're ready to roll. Most or many Christians in America are not ready to roll. They're not ready to see the Savior. No. 
They got too much baggage that they've been carrying around and around because they've been making excuses for. This is what the Bible says. Paul speaking in the New Testament, he says, to them that rob, let him rob no more. Now that's an interesting thing. All it means is this. If you used to lie, stop lying. If you used to cheat, quit cheating. If you used to run around and cheat on your wife, stop it. Come on now. If you had a short temper, stop it. You used to be a mean person, stop it. It can't get any easier than that. Or simpler, I should say. Because here's the thing. You and I have the Spirit of God inside of us. He resides inside of us. And He gives us the power to stop the junk. I said He gives us the power to stop the junk. No excuse. But you don't understand, Pastor, the way I grew up. It doesn't matter. But you don't understand how I was abused. I understand that, and I'm, my sympathies and my, I, my heart breaks for you. But now you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's been under the blood. I said that's under the blood. You can't get stuck in the past. You can't get stuck in moments that happened to you that were horrific or terrible. I understand it happened, but you can't get stuck there. You got to get up and keep moving. Thank you, Lord. We got to work it out daily. It's a process. I know God is transforming you and changing you. And yes, we understand there's some deep emotional scars that may be there for a long period of time. But I'm here to tell you, God will heal you as you continue to seek after him. There is no scar that the Lord can't heal. There is no brokenness that he cannot put back together. But what I found is many people use that as an excuse, as a crutch, so they can continue to be mean. So they can continue to be angry. They continue to be full of rage. They can be, continue to be abusive. No, stop it. There is no excuse. We see that throughout Scripture. I mean, the woman who's caught in adultery. Jesus literally saved her life, didn't he? Did he excuse her sin? No. Here's the truth of the matter with that story. She should have been stoned. According to the law, not only her, but her companion should have been. They both should have been stoned right there, right on the spot. Because that's what the law said. Now, when they asked Jesus about it, did Jesus say, no, the law is wrong? No. Did he make excuses? No. All he said was, he bowed down, wrote on the ground, and he says, well, you know what? He who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. In other words, you're going to judge her? Okay. But before you judge her, how about judging yourself? How about you? What have you done in the past that's worth stoning? Here's the truth. Every sin that we commit is worth stoning. Why I say that? This is what it says. For the wages of sin is death. That's what it says, doesn't it? The wages of sin is death. What that means is if you sin, you just earn something. And what you earn was death. So everybody is guilty. Everybody. So now you're going to be arbitrarily figuring out who's going to be and who's not? No, you ain't the judge. So they tell him, and he says, well, who's without stone, let him cast the f Who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And little by little, the stones hit the ground, and the people took off. They all beat feet, didn't they? Now the lady is left. Now, did again... Did Jesus somehow condemn the, the law saying, you know, that law is unfair, that law is unjust, you know? No, he didn't address the law. 
All he asked the lady is, lady, ma'am, lady, where are your accusers? Well, there is none. Okay. Guess what? Neither do I. Now, it didn't end there, did it? What did he tell her? Go and what? There it is. Sin no more. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you right now. I'm going to forgive you. But guess what? Go and sin no more. Today in America, we say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Now let me go do it again. And, oh, I got an excuse because, you know, grace covers me all. Grace covers it all. Grace knew, uh, you know, God knew I was going to screw up again and again, but he still loves me. He still forgives me. So that, in other words, they use that as an opportunity to sin. And that is a bunch of baloney. Hmm. He who sinned, let him sin no more. We have the power of the Holy Ghost. That when temptation comes, the Spirit says no. And he gives us the power to not only say no, but to do no. Somebody say amen. So don't tell me, well, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do jack. Are you hearing me? The devil don't make you do anything. You did it. God has given you the Holy Spirit so that you don't have to do it. Let me say amen. Thank God that we have the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to say no to sin. Thank you, Lord. See, the Lord not only saves you from the condemnation and the guilt of sin, but also he saves you from the power of sin. Somebody say amen. We have the power to say no. Thank you, Jesus. But instead, we can live a life that is godly, a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. A life that is God-like, in other words, Christ-like. To live like Jesus. That's what he's saying here. Now, here's the key. To be able to walk in righteousness and to be able to walk in godliness, here it is. It says, the godly will live in your presence. Here's the key to it. We're able to walk in righteousness. We're able to be worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. We're able to be people who walk in godliness because we dwell in the presence of God. We are living in the presence of God. When you are connected to the Lord, then all these wonderful things begin to work, flow in your life. You're walking in righteousness. You're walking in worship. Your life is a worship unto the Lord. And you're walking in godliness. You're walking in joy. You're walking in peace. You're walking in anointing. You're walking in purpose. You're walking in divine favor. You're walking in the blessings of the Lord. Why? Because you're living in Christ. You are in Christ. You are living in His presence. That's what we need to do. That's what the church needs to do. Revival is about getting back, living in the presence of God. Revival is, 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 is when you and I reconnect and stay connected to the power, the presence, and the person of Jesus Christ. He revives us. He brings us back to life. He tells us in the book of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, then you're going to bear what? Much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't get any clearer than that, right? It's staying connected. And that's what the devil is after. The devil's trying to disconnect us. He knows that if I can get them from living in the presence of God to living in the in you know in what's going on in society and living in the culture and living into what's happening in the news if I can get them there then I I I got it beat I got them I got them but we need to stay connected and not allow these distractions and all this mess listen to me I'm going to say some things here that I hope you understand my heart because this is what we're living in right now Listen, if you decide to take the vaccine or if you decide not to take the vaccine, you're still my brother and my sister. I still got to love you. That's your choice. 
It's what you choose to do. Either way, I'm going to love you. Either way, you're still my brother or my sister. Amen? Whether you wear a mask or don't wear a mask, hey, that's your choice. You're still my brother or my sister. I'm still going to love on you. Are you hearing me this morning? Why are we allowing this garbage to separate us? Come on now. Listen, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Independent, I still love you. You're still my brother and my sister. That's not going to stop me from loving you. Hello. I don't care if you're white, black, brown, orange, purple, pink, or a mixture of it all. We are still one in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew, Jew nor Gentile, nor rich or free, nor slave or bond, or slave or free, I should say, or, or male or female. We are all one, all one. There's only one Savior. There's not a white Savior, a black Savior, a brown Savior, a yellow Savior. No, there's only one Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. There's only one church. Amen. So why are allowing all of this garbage to separate us? Because when we do, guess what? It's a distraction, number one. And guess what? Sin creeps in. Because now we start judging one another and start condemning one another. Because he or she has a mask or doesn't have a mask. Or he or she took the, the vaccine or did not take the vaccine. Are you crazy? <laughs> we love people no matter what. Thank you, Jesus. And we're called to be one no matter what. Somebody say amen. When we start getting into that type of stuff, the devil's laughing because now I got them separated. And as I separate them, guess what? Little by little, the presence of God begins to fade in their lives. They're so caught up in all that junk that they don't recognize that we're called to live in his presence. And we live in his presence through his word. That's why we have to be people of his word. You, you got to read and study the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that changes. Faith coming by hearing and hearing the Word of God. How is your... See, I, I see this every... Oh, my gosh. Every time I go to the hospital and I have to go meet with people because they're suffering. I can't tell you. They call themselves Christians, but they, they don't even know one scripture. Well, how are you going to call yourself a, script, a, a Christian when you don't even know the scriptures? So how, what are you trusting in? Well, I believe in God. The devil believes in God. And he ain't saved. Well, I believe in Jesus. What do you mean you believe in Jesus? You believe he's existed? Well, guess what? Demons know that Jesus is alive. Does that mean they're saved? Come on now. Too many of us are hoping that our brothers and sisters, we're hoping that our family members are saved just because they say Jesus. They ain't saved unless they accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they're living a life consistent with their confession. If they're not, they're not. You can't make excuses for it. But see, we see that say, surely, surely, you know, God is not going to send my brother, my sister, my uncle, my, my uncle, my aunt, my mother, my grandmother. He's not going to send them to hell. First of all, God doesn't send anybody to hell. You choose to go there. It's your choice. It's an act of your will. Because if you don't choose to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't choose to accept the saving grace that's found in Christ Jesus, then you just condemned yourself. God didn't do it. You did so how are you going to blame God? How are you going to blame God? Again, it's amazing. These are so-called Christians. I'm sitting there, and you can tell they're disconnected from the things of God. They're Christian name only because they, their lives are inconsistent. How are you going to sit there and blame God because you decided to live a certain lifestyle, and because of your lifestyle, you are now paying the price of it, and somehow it's God's fault? How is that possible? Happens all the time. I say to some of the, some of the people actually, you know, 
I get called when somebody is deceased, okay? And I come to the room, they're, they're, they're gone. You know, for the deceased, I, there's nothing I can do for them, right? There's nothing that anybody can do for them. Once they're dead, they're gone. But I can't tell you how many times I come to the room and they say, can you do something for my, my you know, deceased loved one? Uh, no. But I will pray for you. I'm not here for the dead. I'm here for the living. If you wanted me to do something for your, why don't you call before the person died? Why did you wait until after they're dead? Then you want to call a priest or you want to call. And he, let me be very real. After the person is dead, the priest don't come. Are you hearing me? That's a, that's a fact. In that hospital, they will say, we want last rites. Okay, if the first thing that the, see, my job is to assess what's going on. So I'll go through there and they'll, they'll tell me, um, these people are Catholic. They want a priest to come and do the last rites. I said, okay, question number one. Is the patient still alive? No, the patient's dead. He ain't coming. They're not coming. They're not allowed to come. They only come if the patient's still alive. The once the patient dies, what they'll tell me is, we'll pray for the family. What's the name of the family? We'll pray a prayer at the church. That's it. But that's it. It's over. And then they say, well, 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 if the priest not come, can you come? I'll come for you. I'll come. But can you do something for my deceased loved one? What am I going to do for them? I don't have fairy dust. I don't have a magic wand that somehow I'm going to say something and that's going to usher them into the presence of God. After death comes judgment. That's it. That's why it's before, right? And then when I ask them, well, what was the faith? Well, eh, we were nominal this, that. Did you go to church? No. But at the end of your life, you're calling for a preacher. <laughs> and you want me to do what? Again, do some magic ritual that somehow is going to usher them into the presence of God forever and ever. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. We are to live, amen, in His presence. We are to surrender to Him daily. We ought to show fruits of repentance. That's what the Bible says. There is nothing I can do. There's nothing I don't... You can bring the greatest preacher on the face of the planet to that room and there's nothing they can do. You can bring the Pope to that room and he can do anything for them. You can bring whoever you want to bring. There's nothing that we can do for it. That's why we're supposed to live for Jesus now. So when death comes, it's nothing but a transitional door that ushers us from one state of reality to the next. For the Christian, guys, for the Christian, when I've been at the bedside of Christians when they die, and guess what? It's nothing but a door. I've been by, with the family was there, and they were worshiping the Lord, they're singing, they're singing in tongues, they're just giving God glory as the person is dying. They're full of joy and full of peace because they know. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, my grandma, no, my mom, she was serving the Lord. She loved Jesus. She had worship. She, they told me all the wonderful testimony of the woman's life. So they knew, no, no, we're here. We, we called you because, you know, we, we want you to be here as a, as a preacher, as a pastor, because our preacher, our pastor can't be here, but you can. And so what I do, I join in with them. We sing and we worship the Lord around the bed. And there, there goes their loved one, ushered into the presence of the Lord. And everybody's speaking in tongues and, yes, crying, but giving God glory. Why? Because they were living in His presence. And when you live in His presence, you can die in His presence. Somebody say amen. You do so by His word. You got to know the word. And you do so by flowing in the Spirit of God, allowing the Spirit of God to move and flow in your life. Don't grieve the Holy Ghost. Cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Let Him use you. Let Him flow in you and through you. Let the gifts of the Spirit 
be manifested. And of course, let the fruit of the Spirit continually be manifested in your life as you are led by the Spirit. And we're able to live in His presence through prayer and meditation. And I'm not talking about five-minute little rattling off, these are my needs, Lord, and walk away. No, it's about daily, daily. The Bible talks about pray without ceasing. You know, you can pray while you're working. You can pray while you're walking. You can pray while you're exercising. You can pray while you're gardening. You can pray while you're doing anything. Pray continually. Continually have God on your heart and talk to Him. And then guess what? You're talking to Him. You're having this dialogue with Him. That's called prayer. Meditation is when you pause to, to, to look at a particular, something that God will give you or a, a phrase or, or God will somehow highlight you a scripture and you stop there and you begin to meditate on that scripture and you begin to think about it and let that scripture speak to you. That's called meditation. I'm not talking about sitting in the corner like the yoga people. Go, hum. That's not talking about that. That's not, med that's not meditation that we're talking about. Meditation is, is meditating on a particular truth of the Word of God. And you sit there and, oh man, God is so good. Man, God is so loving. How I know He's good? Because He's done this for me. And, he's done that. and you begin to rehearse all of that? That's called meditating. You're meditating on the goodness of the Lord. Meditating on the love of God. You're meditating on a truth that God has revealed to you in the Scripture. That's how we live in His presence. And we do it continually, not just on a Sunday for an hour or two, but every day, all day. Being God conscious. Being God conscious. He closed his message with the last one. What happens when you are living in his presence? Well, number one, when you're living in his presence, it activates purpose. Because it's in his presence that God tells you why you live, why you're alive today. He reveals his purpose to you. You're here to do this. Now, I'm here to tell you, first of all, there is what we call general revelation and specific revelation. Here's the general revelation that we're all called to. This is all of our purpose. Number one. You know what our number one purpose for every believer is? Worship God. Uh, do you hear me? You don't need to pray about that. That's revealed already. We are called to be worshipers of God. Number two, we're called to be servants of God. That is a fact. You don't need to pray about that one. God has called you to serve. Somebody say amen. Another one that's already written scripture that you don't have to pray about. We're called to share our testimony and to win souls for Christ. You don't have to pray about that. I wonder if God wants me to go out there and, and talk to my neighbor about Jesus. No, you don't have to ask that question. It's already been answered. Matthew 28, 18. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You don't have to pray about that. It's already revealed to you. And there are many other ones like that. How about to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, strength, and, and mind, and then to love your neighbor as yourself? Do you need to pray about that? To see if, if that applies to you? That does apply to you. See, here's the problem. If you're not doing the general revelation, then God's never going to get to the specific one. Ooh, did you hear me? If you're not doing the general things that God tells you to do, what makes you think he's going to try to reveal to you specific ones? Do what is already revealed. That is as black and white, that is as, 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 as what do you call it, as obvious as possible do that first and as you're doing that now God says okay now that you're doing that but these are some of the specific things I want you to do and he begins to reveal them to you oh it got quiet there but that's the truth why do you want to go to step five when you haven't done step one mm. The Lord begins to activate His power, His purpose, His promises, His provision, all, all His protection. All of these things begin to become activated in your life. Why? Because you are dwelling and living in His presence. It's activated in your life. In other words, it begins to flow in you. 
because you're connected to him hear me church I know we live in a very difficult time. I know that there's a lot of confusion out there. I know there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of craziness going on in the world today. But I'm here to tell you God is calling us. We need to live in his presence. Because what's out there will drive you batty. It will drive you mad. Listen, you'll be depressed every day, all day. But when you are living in his presence, he is constantly pouring out of his grace and his mercy and his goodness and his kindness. You are tapped into his power. You are tapped into his anointing. You are tapped into his purpose, into his favor. You are tapped into the very storeroom of heaven. It's now available to you because you are living in his presence. That is what God is saying today. That is the word of the Lord today. God wants us to live in his presence. And as we live in his presence, we will live righteously. We will be worshipers. And we will be God-like. We'll be living a God-like existence. And guess what? That is what will attract people to us. They say, man, how is this person, oh, you know, lives so righteously? This person who who's very godly, you know, and this person who's constantly worshiping, I want to know what makes them tick because they seem to be always at peace and full of joy. No greater testimony. And that opens the door to evangelize. Amen? But who in the heck, who wants to talk to a person about their God who's grumpy and mean and nasty and you know, if that's your God, you can keep him. <laughs> I don't need God to do that. I do that all the time. I want to know how can you be in peace. I want to know how you can walk, live differently. I, I want to know how in the world you walk around here constantly singing and praising God and worshiping the Lord in the midst of all the craziness going on in this world. Then we get to tell them, right? get to tell. So I want to encourage the church, let's continue to live in His presence. Let nothing distract you or stop you from living in the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your power, and your majesty. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to live in your presence. And by being connected to you and by your Holy Spirit flowing in and us, we can live, Father, lives that are righteous. We can live lives, oh God, that are godly. We can be those who worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we thank you that as we walk in that faith and we walk in that lifestyle, as we walk, oh God, in that that manner of living, Lord, it's going to activate power and purpose and anointing and provision and protection and it will cause us to live in the presence of the Lord daily where we're constantly being re regenerated and renewed and restored and refreshed because we live in the presence of God help us oh God today to be reminded of these things and to stay connected now I know just about everybody in this room today but there may be somebody watching that I don't know. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I want to reach out to you. If you have never made Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised to anybody. The Bible says today, now is the time of salvation. This is the moment. And you may not get this moment again. The Holy Spirit is wooing you. The Holy Spirit is calling you to His presence. He wants to live inside of you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to connect you to the Savior. All you have to do is yield. What you need to do is surrender. What you need to do is recognize your need of a Savior. Your need of God in your life. And all you have to do is, is speak to God. This will be called prayer. A simple prayer that says... God, I recognize my need of a Savior. I am lost and I'm done. Lord, without you in my life, I, I don't know what I'll do. 
So Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my errors. Forgive me of my shortcomings and my failings. Give me a second chance at life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my King. I surrender my life to you, Lord. I surrender my life to you. If you pray that type of prayer with sincerity, I'm here to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ hears that prayer and He will come. He will enter into your life. He will clean you up on the inside. He will put His Spirit inside of you. You'll breathe the breath of life inside of you and you begin to truly live. You become born again. A second chance of life. And from that moment on, he'll begin to teach you and show you as you submit yourself to reading and studying the Word of God. As you commit yourself to joining a church and getting involved and getting plugged in and being discipled by other believers so they can help you to grow in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the Word of God and of the things of God. That is what God is calling for you. But it's your choice. It's up to you. So this morning, give your heart to Christ. Give your life over to Him. Let Him be your God. Let Him be your Savior. And He will do so. And He will make that connection. And everything will begin to change. Because He's a good God who loves you. Who loves you this morning. For the believer, my brother and sister, don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything disconnect you. Because if you do, you are headed for disaster. It's time that we awaken to that reality that the Lord wants us to, for us to not visit His presence, but live in His presence. It's not about visitation. No. It's about habitation. It's not that Christ visits our life. It's that God inhabits our life. Church, don't, be, don't, don't forget that. Let Him inhabit us. And fill our hearts with His presence at all times. Let's surrender to Him daily. How many would say amen and amen? I'm going to ask Sister Maria to come on up. Uh, she's going to dismiss in prayer for the service. However, I'm going to ask you to stand fast because Pastor Doug's going to give us a quick announcement at the end of the service. So as Sister Maria comes to dismiss us, Pastor Doug, you can come on up too. And then once she dismisses us from the service, then Pastor Doug has an announcement that he needs to uh, bring forth. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, for your love. Lord, we thank you that you have given us everything that we need, Lord, to live a godly life, to follow you, Lord. So help us, Father, every day to choose you, Lord, to, to choose to serve you, not the flesh, Lord, or anything else but you, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to abide in your presence, Lord, to read your word, Lord, to know the truth, Lord, to hide it in our hearts, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for your people, Lord, who made it out to your house today father we pray a blessing upon them and those who are watching lord we pray that you bless them with your joy with your peace with your love father with your wisdom father god we pray for strength and courage upon each and one of them lord for their families lord we pray a hedge of protection over them lord send your angels to guide and protect them at their every need father god we thank you lord for today we bless your name father and we thank you in jesus mighty name we pray amen Praise the Lord. Um, week of Saturday, of course, there were those of us who went and put door hangers on doors throughout the neighborhood, letting them know that the 28th, this coming Saturday, we'd be coming back to their doors with petitions. Now, our goal is to really meet the need of our neighbors by, and, our, and benefit ourselves by getting our roads repaired. Jesus met the felt needs of the people. When healing, deliverance, uh, resurrection, whatever he did, he met them at their felt need. But at the same time, it opened up a door for him to bring the kingdom of God to them. Our goal by helping get these streets in our neighborhood uh, repaired through the city and our city councilmen, 
this is going to open up the door for us to be able to bring other ministries into our community. We, with the petitions, we'll be gathering their names, we'll get their addresses, their phone numbers, their email. That will go into our church database. Then when it's time to do a health fair, I had a, a follow-up with my doctor uh, Friday, and I'm in great health, but anyhow, he is the president of the Christian uh, Dental and Medical Association. I said, our church is gonna wanna be producing a health fair in the near future. He said, when the time comes, we'll sign up. There's also the opportunity for trunk or treat, vacation Bible school, so many different opportunities for ministry out of this church through this one endeavor, getting petitions to actually get our streets fixed, amen? This Saturday, now hanging door knockers, uh, it, does, it doesn't take much time, our door hangers, but it takes a lot of time to take petitions. We had four, we need this Saturday between 16 and 20 people. I'm going to make a petition or appeal to my school of ministry Monday night, but we definitely need to have volunteers go door to door in the places we've already hung our door hangers and take petitions. In other words, take names, addresses, phone numbers, as well as their signature so that we can then take those petitions to our city councilman who already has $1.5 million set aside for these roads but decides it's gonna wait a year and a half, two years. That's too far, too down the road, so we need to do that. And if, I don't know if we're still recording or not, but the thing is, if there are people out there that have been watching, they need to join us as well. Thank you very much, God bless.